Don't just assume because it says Baptist Church on the sign that you're going to get the right stuff. Make sure that they believe and teach the Word of God to be what it is. So today I want to talk to you about yet another controversial issue. Why should I give money to the church? This is one of those things where people visit a church, if the preacher preaches on money, they say, I'll oh, see, here you go again. That church is always talking about money. It's all they want. Money, money, money. Well, my friend, I don't have any problem preaching about money for a couple of reasons. One, it's biblical. Two, I'm not paid on commission. I'm salaried. So if there's $100,000 in the offering today, it don't mean I get a bonus. I'm not paid on commission. That's not how it works. I don't stick my hand in the offering plate. I don't, I don't even touch the offering plate. So I can tell you what the Word of God says because it's not going to benefit me other than my own obedience. Why should I give my money to the church? And in our series of dealing with the basics of Christianity, I wanted to deal with this after we had dealt with some of the other foundational issues. Because we do have so many people who are either new believers or have, have never been in church or haven't been in church since you were a kid and you've never really heard anybody teach what the Bible says about giving to the church. Now, we have all sorts of charities that we give money to. You know, it used to be for a while there if you went to the movie theater about once a year, those guys would talk, pass around the popcorn buckets collecting money for this. Or you have people at work, they're asking if you want to give to the United Way or give to this or give to that. And always hitting you up for something. And so what has happened is when, when you go to the checkout register at PetSmart buying dog food, they ask, would you like to add a dollar to help homeless pets? Everywhere you go, somebody is nickel and diming you for charities. And I don't have a problem with giving to charities. I think it's good that you help out. But what happens is if we're not careful, that carries over into church too. Or we just, the offering plate comes around and we just think, well, here, I got $5 in my pocket and we put that. Folks, God has given us very clear direction on why we're to give, how we're to give. And I want us to look this morning at why we should give money to the church. Because first of all, God's word establishes the principle of giving. There's a biblical principle of giving. There's a biblical principle of giving. In the Old Testament, last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. In chapter 3, we see a passage that deals specifically with God and Israel. Remember, Israel was under the sacrificial system. They had a very strict legal system, all of which was meant to point them to the fact that the law could not save them, that Messiah was one day coming. Nevertheless, they were to be obedient in these things. And in Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, or in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Will a man rob God? This is God speaking. Yet, you're robbing me. But you say, well, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. In verse 9 he continues, You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you that would, that, so that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now, first of all, we see that God is speaking directly to Israel here. There is a contemporary, historical, grammatical application to this text. He is speaking to his covenant people, Israel, when he's giving them this. Now, several things we see here. First of all, God intends for believers to give to support the work. God expects us to give to support the work. It was that way in the Old Testament times. You, you see that the giving um, of, of tithes and offerings here was, was meant to support all of the many works that the, the temple was responsible for, uh, among which included feeding the poor, caring for them, ministering to people, taking care of people, that sort of thing. So you see that there's an evidence of that in Matthew, or Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. The whole reason for having food in the storehouse was to meet the needs of others, hence ministry. God has always intended for his people to give so that the work of the kingdom might be supported. Not only that, God intends for believers to give to support the workers. Uh, here you see that the priests, of course, the Levitical priests were dependent upon that. But we also see over in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 4, the Apostle Paul wrote this. 
He was talking about that he'd been bragging about their, the, the Corinthians' provision and how they were caring for them. And he says in verse 4, Lest if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we should not be put to shame by this confidence. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift, that the same might be ready as a bountiful gift, and not affected by covetousness. You see here that they had made a pledge to meet a need. And Paul was reminding them of this, that they would be found faithful. And when those he had told, oh, they are so faithful, they promised this gift, that when they get there, they wouldn't be ashamed. That indeed they had given according to the promise they had given. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, in verse 17, you see again the principle of giving to support the workers. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Most churches today, uh, the staff, that is the only job they have. They are paid to be staff members. I have people say all the time, Well, preacher, I wish I had a job like you where I only had to work on Sunday and on Wednesday night. I say, if you find a job that's actually like that, you let me know. Uh, If not, I challenge any of you to try to get ready for a 35, 40-minute sermon one week. While you also have to prepare for two more one-hour classes, call people, return calls, email people, go see people, put out fires. See, preachers are also volunteer firemen. (laughs) See, my friends, if only if it were that easy. On the average, there's probably 10 to 12 hours per message, per class. So you figure that up three a week, that's 36, 40 hours. Then you figure in all the appointments that you have to make with people and and, and the the appointments with people that have genuine problems and then people whose feelings have gotten hurt about something and you've got to stroke them and you bring your fire extinguisher, you know, it's okay. (laughs) Fire's out, move on. Because, you know, not everybody is a mature enough believer to deal with the adversity that comes in our life. Sometimes we have to blame it on somebody else. So you see, the church has set things up from the very beginning. God has established the church, the temple, that the workers will be supported. Folks, I don't have another job. I can't work more hours to make more money. Uh, in, in fact, I've known some pastors that have tried to go out and get a little second job on the side, and the church has a fit. I can't believe our preacher would go and get a job doing something else. Well, the problem is some churches absolutely refuse to pay their staff enough to live. Now, everybody else wants to make sure that they can pay for their $3 gasoline and pay for their $120 a month cable and all this other sort of stuff. Oh, them preachers ain't supposed to live like that. God's Word says it's okay. Paul never took a wife, but he said in Scripture, is it not all right for me to have a wife and a family if that was God's will for me? Is it not all right for me to have these things? Be careful, because God has set it up that as we give, it supports the work and the workers. Now, this church has always been very good about that. But, my friends, I remember a church about 20 years ago. It was right when I was starting ministry. There was a church on the west coast of Florida that was wanting to increase their giving to the cooperative program. Those of you who don't know what the cooperative program is, as Southern Baptists, that was really the thing that started the Southern Baptist Convention. The cooperative program is where all Southern Baptist churches pool together their money and send a little off to the Southern Baptist Convention uh, for what's called the cooperative program. Uh, The cooperative program supports missionaries, missions work. It supports our seminaries. Funding goes to some of our Baptist colleges, such as our own great North Greenville University right up the road from here. Uh, All of that is made possible by all of these Southern Baptist churches pooling their resources together and saying, we can do more as a group than we can as individuals. Hence, the Southern Baptist Convention and the cooperative program. But this particular church decided that since they wanted to give more to the cooperative program, they cut their pastor's salary and their staff salary. It's a smaller church, but they said, yeah, we want to give more to the cooperative program, so we're going to cut your salary. What had that church just done? They'd shot themselves in the foot. God has established things to be this way. 
I'm grateful for how Riverside has taken care of me and my family and, and the families of our staff. But my friends, you need to understand, that is how God has established it to be. So God's Word has established the principle of giving, but it's also established the priority of giving. Back over in Malachi, you see again that if we do not give the first to God, it's a sin. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus, God says, Will a man rob God? Now this is a scary thing to think that you're robbing God. I've seen bumper stickers on pickup trucks that says there's nothing in this truck that is worth your life. That guy's trying to tell you, my friends, you don't want to mess with his stuff. My friend, do you really want to mess with God's stuff? God says, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? Well, all the people of Israel said, well, wait a minute, how have we robbed you? God says, in tithes and offerings. Now, what is a tithe? Tithe isn't something you wear around your neck. Tithe literally means a tenth. A tenth. The Old Testament was very plain that the tithe, the ten percent of your income, the first tenth was to be given to God, to the temple. Now there were actually other tithes and offerings too, to the point that they were actually required, depending on things, to give up to 23% of their income. That's where you had the tithes and the offerings. The, the tithe was sort of the standard. You gave that as the minimum requirement. But then you had the offerings that went over that. You had the sin offerings. You had the thanksgiving offerings. You had other offerings that went over the top so that you actually gave more than that. And Israel was not doing that any longer. They had said, well, we don't need to give quite so much to God anymore. God, we've got other expenses, other things we need to take care of. We'll just cut back a little bit. God says, you're robbing me. You're ripping me off. Not giving the first to God is a sin. The best practice is when you get paid, don't give God what's left. Give God off the top. Now, to some people that don't give, that's a scary proposition. Because if you're not used to giving in a regular pattern, we'll talk more about that in a minute. And, and I'm not just, just talking about the amount right now. Let's forget about the amount for just a second. All right, so you're saying, preacher, when I get my paycheck, I should write a check off of that before I write any other check. That's not what I'm telling you, my friend. That's the biblical pattern. So, well, that may be what the Bible says, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking what them two guys were saying, not interpreting the Bible literally, might have some merit to it, preacher. Well, go on and let's keep looking at what it is that God says. Verse 9, you've, you're cursed with a curse for you're robbing me. The whole nation, all of Israel was robbing God. And God was leveling judgment against them. But in verse 10, He gives them a corrective measure. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. It, it is a disgrace, my friend, when God's people cannot meet the needs of those that come to it because they don't have the funding. When a church says, well, we can't afford to do that. Now, it's one thing to say, well, we can't afford to build a $15 million facility. It's another thing to say, well, we can't afford to give that family any food. Now, we're not at that point. But, my friend, do you want to get to that point? I don't think there's any church that actively thinks... Well, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's get to where we can't help anybody. But what happens is it's a slippery slope. And my friends, if you and I are not faithful to give God the first fruits of what we get, then we will be finding ourselves in the same position as rebellious Israel. He says, if you will do this, this is amazing. Test me now, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. And my friend, this doesn't mean if you put $10 in the offering plate, God's going to give you $100. It doesn't mean if you put $100 in, He's going to give you $200. That's not how it works. If you give to get, you're giving for the wrong reason. And we'll talk about the heart of giving in just a second. But my friend, I can give you a testimony as well as probably tons of other folks in this place that 90% or 85% of your income goes a lot farther than 100% ever did. I mean, I've tried it both ways. I tried it when I was younger. When I was in college, and I didn't make a whole lot of money. I was a church pianist. You know, it's kind of one of them things. You're like, well, okay, let's see. But my friend, let me tell you something. God always gets what's his. 
God always gets what's His. Now, I'm not saying that your financial difficulties are because you're not faithful giving. There are plenty of people that give faithfully as God lays on their heart that are in the same financial squeeze. But my friend, I'm going to tell you something. You can't expect God to throw open the doors of blessing for you in any area of your life if you are ripping Him off. You need to give to God from the first. But you also see not giving the best is a sin. In Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel, they both, these brothers, were bringing their offerings to God. In verse 2, we see that Abel was a keeper of the flocks. Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel, on his part, brought the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. When Abel brought his sacrifice of his livestock to God, he didn't bring the ugly sheep. He didn't bring the busted up, broken down, missing wool in spot sheep. He didn't bring the sheep with the black eye and the black spot. He didn't bring the sheep, the sheep that couldn't go back. That just went... Whoa. Abel... Bought the biggest, fattest, healthiest, prettiest sheep he had and gave that to God as a sacrifice. The very best went to God. And the Lord had regard for Abel, it says there in the middle of verse, in, toward the end of verse 4, and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Now it says that Abel brought the first and the best, and then it says, and Cain brought an offering. It wasn't that Cain didn't bring an offering. It was that Cain didn't really want to bring an offering, and so he just brought what he thought was okay. That's why the Bible is very specific there in the difference between Cain and Abel's offerings. On the surface, it looks like they're much the same. No, 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 no. Abel found the best looking livestock he had and brought it to God as sacrifice. Cain was like, I can't believe it. I've worked this hard to get all of these crops and now I've got to give some of it to God? Are you kidding me? God can have the squash. I don't like squash anyway. Uh, eggplant. Can't figure out what it is. Eggplant, you can have that, God. Um, this corn looks, nah, I wouldn't eat it anyways. Here, I'll do that. Oh, Cain brought an offering, but it wasn't the best. And he didn't bring it out of a love, thankful heart to God. He brought it because he had to. My friend, let me tell you something. You could put $200 a week in the offering plate, but if you put it in with a sorry attitude, God's not going to accept you or your offering. People in the finance committee says, but the church will accept it. <laughs> sure we will. It's like the preacher had somebody in his church that won a $250 million lottery and said, preacher, you're not going to take Satan's money, are you? God, God was a church member that won it and was going to give, you know, was going to tithe off of, tithe off of $250 million, like $150 million after taxes. This guy was going to give $15 million to the church and one of the high, high and mighty holy roller looking the nose down people in the church said, preacher, you're not going to take the devil's money, are you? Preacher said, you better believe I am. The devil's had that money long enough. Let's see what God can do with it. My friend, if you do not bring the best you have to God, you are showing where God ranks in your priority. You know, a little over a year ago, I guess, I started playing the drums. I hadn't played the drums since I was in high school, I guess, first year of college. I had a friend of mine who was my first year roommate at college. He was an amazing drummer. and He taught me a little bit how to play. Well, I hadn't played except video game rock band, <laughs> in about, you know, 15, 20 years. And so I, one morning I said, well, I think I can do it. And I got on there. And, you know, I, I, I can functionally play the drums all right. I, I'm not Phil Collins. But I do the best I can. Because God deserves my best. When I get up here and preach, I know, folks, I've got a watch. It tells me the same time that you've got. I know what time it is. And there are times I get to talking faster so I can get done because I know the mind can only comprehend what the bottom can stand. I under, they taught us that in seminary. I know. 
But my friend, you have to understand that I look forward all week long to telling you the amazing things that the Word of God says. I know some of you say, Preacher, I wish you'd just calm down up there. You just... You get in the church of God sometimes. I'm just waiting for you to break out a monogram towel and start dabbing it. <laughs> My friend, let me tell you something. I get excited about a lot of things. But there is nothing that excites me more than God and what He has done and His Word and the fact that this God that is so amazing and so righteous and so holy looked through the corners of time, saw Marcus Allen Buckley, a reprobate, sorry, good-for-nothing sinner, and said, Jesus you're dying for him. And Jesus said gladly, because I love him. My friend, there's nothing better for me to be excited about. There's nothing better for me to talk about or shout about or cry about or laugh about or sweat about or go hoarse about. Because he deserves my best. Sunday might not be the only day of the week I work, but it's certainly the one that gets the best physical workout. Because my friend, he deserves my best. And I'm going to give him everything I've got. I pray that I go out preaching. (laughs) What better way to go? My second option is going in my sleep. (laughs) But my first option, you know, is just go ahead and absolutely preach the Word of God. Let God's Holy Spirit take what in... what terrible shortcoming bit my abilities have and throw it out there and when I pray and say amen I just go on home that suit me just fine but as long as I'm drawing breath he is going to get my best he's not going to get what's left I'm going to give him everything I've got because he gave everything to me he deserves the first and the best. God's Word gives us and establishes the principle of giving. It establishes the priority of giving. But it also establishes a regularity of giving. A regularity of giving. Giving is a spiritual commitment. It is a spiritual commitment. In Luke chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus said, For where your heart is, there is your treasure will be also. Yeah, every once in a while, you'll get one of these smarmy people say, well, I see where the church's money goes. Preacher's driving that Challenger. Preacher's wife driving that striped up Charger. Charger's a 2008. What year do you drive? Uh, preacher shouldn't drive cars like that. I see where church is money. Preacher dipping his hand into the offering plate. Folks, Eric is the church administrator, which means he handles the money. Do you really think Eric Wall is going to let me get near one dollar? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Say, preacher, well, you shouldn't be spending all that money on cars. Really? All right, well, how many golf clubs do you have? How many softball bats you have? How many tennis rackets you have? You know, I know guys that think $75 for a game of golf is a good deal. (laughs) Can I get an amen? You know, I I mean, that just, that makes me hurt. Why? Because I'm not a golfer. Folks, I don't play golf. I don't go fishing. I don't play softball anymore. (laughs) I don't spend my money on all them things. I have two car payments. I figure if I gotta have car payments, it might as well be something that I enjoy driving. Now, if you wanna go out and spend $1,000 a month on golfing, go right ahead. If you wanna spend $800 on an aluminum softball bat, knock yourself out. If you wanna spend whatever amounts of money you do doing fishing and golfing and horseback riding or whatever you do, knock yourself out. But I'll tell you this, what, where you spend your money shows what you're passionate about. No problem. How passionate are you for God? Does God get as much as direct TV does? Does God get as much as the country club does? Does God get as much as any of these other things we pursue? 
Just trying to get you to think, folks. Jesus said, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Someone were to exa- examine the garage and the closet of our life, where would they find our treasure to be? You see, giving is a spiritual commitment. But following that is a physical and financial commitment. In Mark chapter 12, we see one of the most powerful examples of this. In Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 41, we see the widow and giving her might. Some of you have heard this, but in Mark chapter 12, verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the multitude were putting money in there. And many rich people were putting in large sums. You know, our church is running a very tight ship right now, folks. Giving's low. Most churches are dealing with the same thing because it's an economy. And in the econ- a bad economy, the first thing to go is giving to charity, including the church. First place we cut back is, well, let's maybe not give so much to the church. Let's just pull back about $25 a week. Well, that's fine, but if everybody does that, then the church winds up being three or $4,000 a week short. Folks, you know, we have a $7,000 a month mortgage on this building. Seven grand a month. You think your mortgage is bad. Now, the good news is we're only about, what, two and a half years from paying it off? About two and a half years from paying all of it off. And boy, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we burn that mortgage, <laughs> and we're going to tear it up. Now you think, well, preacher, we'll be fine when we get that done. Sure, but what about the next two and a half years? And do you really think that we're never going to need to spend money on anything else ever again? Folks, we're starting release time this fall. We're bringing high school students over here to teach them the Word of God every day. You know what that costs? That's going to cost us probably twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 a year. Our television ministry. I had somebody emailed me up in North Carolina. I said, Pastor, I know you tell on television anymore. You know, if there's any way at all you can put it back on television, we sure appreciate it. I said, well, ma'am, we'd be glad to. The problem is it costs us about $2,000 a month. And we're just waiting on the checks to start rolling in. I didn't quite say that because I understood. I, I know that's a useful thing. A lot of people shut in. A lot of people in other states watched us. But, folks, the reality is, If God's people aren't giving, the church is going to have to cut back on some things. Do we want to? No. But my friends, you and I need to realize that potentially there are people that might not hear the gospel as a result of that television program because we got to cut somewhere. You see, my friends, you and I need to understand that it's one thing to say, Oh, Lord, I love you. Yeah, I'm going to start giving to you. But then you actually have to do it. It's just like people who walk an aisle, pray a prayer, get baptized, and then disappear, never to be seen in church again. You go through the motions, but there is no heart change. Listen, my friend, the only way you and I can give as God wants us to give is by Him changing our hearts. I can't tell you how many times I've had people look on the back of the bulletin and look at the giving versus what the budget is. It's like, preacher, you need to start preaching on the tithe. My friend, I'm not going to stand up here every week and tell everybody that they need to tithe and they need to do this because if I do that, then the only thing I will be preaching is tithing. What I'm trying to do today is teach you what the Word of God says, but every week I'm trying to let, get you to let God change your heart. Because my friend, when God changes your heart, He'll change your checkbook. God's economy will change your economy. God's Word establishes the principle of giving, the priority of giving, the regularity of giving, but it also establishes the dangers of not giving. In Luke chapter 12, you see Jesus dealing with the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the one who put in huge amounts. This widow had put in everything she had. It was a couple of, it was a mite. It was basically the equivalent of one-eighth of a penny. One-eighth of one cent. One-sixty-fourth of a day's wages. All she had put it in. Jesus said that woman put in more than all these rich people did. My friend, God's not concerned about the amount as he is the heart behind it. But if you do not give, there's several things that can happen. First of all, money will shift your priorities. 
In Luke chapter 12, verse 20 through and on, Jesus is telling people, why are you worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear? Look at the flowers. You don't see flowers work, yet Solomon in all his glory wasn't arrayed like them. The birds, they don't have a job, yet they eat. Jesus said, don't worry about all that stuff. What he does tell us is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. My friend, when you and I, if we are not careful, money will shift our priorities. People say, that's right, preacher. Love of money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. It says a, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You love money and not have it. That's why people rob banks. Because they love it and they want it, but they don't have it, so they're going to take it from somebody who does. Money can shift your priorities. But not only can money shift your priorities, money can become your priority. In Luke eleven forty two, 42, Jesus said, Woe to you Pharisees! You pay tithe of the mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You know, the Pharisees love to brag that they even gave 10% of their garden they gave 10% of all their money, but they'd even go and take 10% of the mint and bring it as an offering. 10% of all the herbs and spices they had and would bring that as an offering. That's impressive, isn't it? I mean, you people, some people would say, Preacher, we need tithers like that. They tithe off a gift card. Jesus said, Big givers don't guarantee anything. I've seen churches become dependent on people because they were big givers. And sometimes they were sorry reprobates, but they wouldn't let the preacher address their sin or anybody else address their sin. Why? Well, you know, preacher, they're big givers. If we run them off, we ain't, we're going to lose a lot of money. If you're not careful, money becomes your priority instead of the righteousness and the holiness of God. Not only money shift your priority or become your priority, it can become your God. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Apostle Paul's warning Timothy of this. It's a very real problem. Everybody has to deal with it. You know, we live in a world that requires money. However, you've got to understand, if you're not careful, it'll take you over. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, Paul wrote, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves. My friend, anything that becomes you, between you and obedience to God has become your God. Well, you know, preacher, I, I really want to be obedient. I want to be more active in my church. But, you know, my 5 or $10 a week is good enough, right? That's between you and God. I don't know what anybody in this church gives. I know some of you think I do. I bet preacher looks and says who tithes and who don't. No, I don't want to know because I don't want to treat you any differently. There may be some of you that $10 is all in the world you've got. You put it in faithfully every week. And there's some people that might put in 200 a week. They absolutely act like reprobates. I don't want to judge you based on what I see numbers. And I know as a human being, if I look and I see, ooh, they give a lot of money, mm, better not let them go. Would I chase some after somebody who's a big giver over somebody who wasn't? I'm not going to find out because I'm not going to find out what anybody gives. I don't want to know. Sometimes people will hand me an offer, offer an envelope or a check or something. Preacher, can you put this in the offering plate? I, I don't even look at it. I don't, I don't even like to touch it. I put it in Eric's hands or in, in Bo, one of our counter's hands. I do it in somebody's hands as quick as I can so I'm not having it. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to know. It's none of my business. It's between you and God. But be careful that money or any possession or anything doesn't take God's place in your life. Now, finally, God's Word doesn't necessarily establish correct amounts to be given, but correct attitudes in giving. You see that in Mark chapter 12, in verse 41 through 44, where you've got these rich people putting tons of money in, and Jesus is watching, and this widow comes in and puts in her last mite, that one-eighth of a cent, that one-sixty-fourth of a denarius, a day's wage there in, in the Roman Empire. Put in everything she had, and Jesus said, she's given more than all these rich people have. And you know all them guys are like, what in the world are you talking about? Jesus, them big givers putting big money in there. And that woman, did, she put in an eighth of a cent. And you're saying that she's given more? Why would Jesus say that? Because of her heart. Because of her heart. She was willing to give Jesus every last thing she had. 
because she knew God would take care of her. About mm, five or six years ago, another church I pastored, there's a family that's going through a real awful crisis. Layoffs, illness, different things, and they just, they were really hurting. And somebody told me about it, and their family in our church, and I said, well, let's take up a love offering. So I went to the front of the church after the church was over, told we've got a family in our church. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but they're, they're really hurting. They're in a terrible financial bind, and I believe the Word of God tells us we're to care for one another, so we're going to take up a love offering for them. We passed the offering plate up and, and uh, took up almost $2,000, I think it was, at the end of the service after the offering had already been given. And uh, the next day, um, we got the money together, and they called the person who family were giving it to, and, and uh, they came to get it, and the wife was just sobbing in the office, and she said, Pastor, I've got to tell you this. She said, yesterday, you know, because I always tell people, give as the Lord lays on your heart. Whatever God instructs you to write that check for, you write it. Whatever he tells you to put in that offering plate, you trust him, and you see if he won't take care of you. She said, I hear that every week, and I know that, and I believe it, but I've got my checkbook out to write it for one amount, and God said, no, you write it out for this amount. She said, I was going to write it out for $20, and God told me to write it out for 80 I think it was. She said, I kind of stopped. She said, I didn't, you know, you didn't, I didn't hear his voice, but I just knew I was supposed to write that check for $80. I said, God, that's all we've got in our account. I haven't bought groceries yet. We haven't bought gas for the cars yet. The kids need lunch money. I, mean, we don't, I can't do that. That's all I've got for the week. And she said, it was once again, it was just that calm voice that you couldn't quite hear that said, trust me, I'm write that check for 80. She said, I wrote that check, put it in an offering plate. And this morning got a call that that love offering was for us. She said, I didn't know how in the world we were going to make it, but when God told me to write that check, I trusted him. And not 24 hours later, God blessed me in a way I could have never dreamed of. And my friend, I'm not going to tell you it's going to happen every time you give. But it's a perfect example of what happens when you do. Listen, my friends. Giving is an act of worship. It's an act of worship. And it's an act of obedience. And if we don't worship Him and we don't obey Him, we're sinning. So, preacher, I give 10% every week. Isn't that enough? I don't know. What's God tell you? You know, for some people, 10% is not as big an amount as it is for others. If you make a million dollars a year, 10% for you is not as big a, you know, not as big a hurt maybe as it is for somebody who makes $20,000 a year. Unless you're living at the very edge of your means, and that's a mistake that many of us make. Folks, trust God enough to give Him the first and the best. Say, so what about the tithe? What about the tenth? I think it's a great place for you to start. But I think you're making a mistake if you limit yourself. Well, I already give 10%. I'm not going to give any more money to release time. I'm not going to give any more money to the Christmas offering or the Easter missions offering. I'm not going to give any more money to that. So I already give my 10%. Folks, that's not how God works. God doesn't go down with a calculator and a, and a roster sheet and say, nah, that's pretty close to 10%. I'll let that slide. Oh, ooh, they're below 10% there. Uh, can somebody give them the stomach virus? That's not how it works. My friend, God's not as concerned with the amount as he is the heart of the giver. When that offer plate came by earlier, what was in your heart? When you reached in your pocket, you got out that cash, whatever was in there, or you got out your checkbook, or you got out your offering envelope, already had your money in there, and you put it in. Was it just routine, just part of what we do in the Baptist church? Pass the offering plate, put the money in, give it to your kids so your kid can put it in so they can learn about putting the offering in. Or have you really thought about that as an act of worship? When you write that check every week, does it ever occur to you that God may want you to give something more? Or give to something more? Or are you just on autopilot with your giving? That's how we do a worship so many times. I'm telling you, I, I, people, I know that some people in the church get upset if you didn't have a bulletin, but there's plenty of people who don't need one. You know what to do. You know when to stand. You know when to sit up. You just come to church. You just kind of on autopilot. Your giving's on autopilot. Where's your heart? Is, that, is God really getting your best if you're on autopilot? My friend, I'm going to challenge you with something this week. This is a challenge for you. 
This week, I'm challenging this church and everybody in this room, the sound of my voice. I want you to pray and fast this week. You fast from breakfast or lunch one day or wherever God lays on your heart. I'm not giving you directions on that. That's between you and God. But I'm going to challenge you this week to fast and pray and ask what God would have you give over and above what you're giving now. God may say, you're fine what you're doing. You're being obedient. And that's great. But be prepared because God may show some of you. And next week, we're going to have a box up here at the front. And there's going to be a point in the service where we're going to ask you to bring your offering up. I know some people it's going to be maybe hard to do. We're going to have arrangements for that. Don't worry about that. But there's something about bringing it up and putting it in a chest that conveys that idea of giving and sacrificing and worship. Now, I'm not going to give you a dollar figure where I'd like to see it double the tithe or anything like that. No, because I don't. That's God's business, not mine. And whether you do this or are obedient to it or want to try it, what God's Word says, that's totally up to you. But I want to challenge you this week to pray, maybe to fast, and ask the Lord, God, am I giving? Have I given? Will I give what you want me to? I know from time to time you hear people say, well, you know, I've been waiting for a rainy day to give to the right thing. Folks, it's pouring. There's a lot of stuff that this world, this community needs from us that we need to be able to do to them and for them. And it's going to take God's people being faithful and obedient and worshiping Him through giving and trusting Him and saying, God, this isn't about me. It's not about some amount. God, this is what you've laid on my heart to give, and I'm giving it to you freely. Because you've blessed me with so much, I can't even know where to start. Well, be careful, my friend, because this week the devil will give you a thousand excuses. Not to fast, not to pray, not to consider. it. God may tell you that what you're giving is just fine, but be careful that it's not Satan telling you that instead. Seek the Lord, be obedient, and then see what He does in your life. Not because you've given X amount of money, but because you have given your heart. And you have shown the Lord that you truly trust Him. Do you trust Him? Where's your treasure? Where's your treasure?